Um, can we dim the lights a little bit? Perhaps? Yeah. Oh, sorry, Peter. Yeah, I have to have the right mood. Um, okay, um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to, how, how much time do I have? Do I have full 20 minutes? Or 20, yeah, 20. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about uh, Prime, which is a, a just funded project um, in the UK, um, which aims to establish a, a mechanism for metadata exchange between publishers, repositories, and institutional repositories as well, to, to try and link up the data that's in various locations and make it more discoverable. Um, so I, I'm from Ubiquity Press. We're a spin out of UCL. We're a researcher led press. Um, we aim to do things a little bit differently from a lot of the established publishers. We're fully open access, for example, and we, we try to work very closely with the research community um, to reflect their, their requirements, um, which is one of the reasons we, we take part in projects like this before the JISC. Um, I'll give you a very quick overview. That's an archaeologist um, because part of the prime project is centered around archaeology um, as its uh, focus. Um, just to get things started. Um, I'm going to talk about the, sort of the why, where, and how of the Prime project to try and make it um, as relatable as possible. Um, the first thing is about sort of why exchange metadata in the first place. Why, why have we decided that this mechanism would be useful? Um, and where to do that? And the, the, one of the mechanisms we're using to, to try and incentivize and enable the deposit of, of data sets is um, that of data, data journals, and I'll show you some examples of those. And the prime project is then really about how to disseminate the data once it's been deposited and uh, made available. So th that will all make a lot more sense in the coming slides. Um, so the big thing about why, one, one of the things we focus on with why you would exchange, why you would share data in the first place and then why you would try and make that more available by sharing the metadata, um, is why, why do researchers engage um, with, with sharing data in the first place? What's their motivation to do it? Um, so this is my experimental cartoon to see if people in different countries laugh at it. Um, but um, one of the reasons is researchers want to have their, the maximum dissemination for their research. They want, um, as Richard Dawkins does, they want to be a, a household name and they want all researchers to be influenced by their ideas. Um, and in order to do that, they, they need uh, mechanisms in order to, to get their research out further. They can't just put it up on the web or something. They need um, systems to help them. And this is a slide you saw yesterday partly. Oh, no, it's not. Sorry, this is another slide. Um, and this is, these are some of the things we look at as, as the, the motivations for researchers. So there are a lot of public benefits, such as public trust in science, reuse by, the, by um, small and medium enterprises. There are a lot of benefits for the researchers themselves, um, you know, enhanced um, reputation, career recognition, citations, etc., And a lot of benefits for the research community, such as uh, being able to share data, um, create new science by mashing up data sets from different um, disciplines, et cetera. Um, so the, the, we, everybody in this room knows there are a lot of benefits to sharing research data in all of these areas. It's just about, first of all, getting the researchers to understand that, um, getting especially publishers engaged in this, and building systems that will, will make it more possible. So this was the slide you partly saw yesterday. Um, the very first journal published in the world um, in 1665. Um, and the whole, the whole point of this was that in order for science to advance, um, we have to share information. We have to let other people validate um, what we've done, build upon it. And it's the whole principle of standing on the shoulders of giants, et cetera, is what makes science, makes the research world advance. And this is what we call the, the social contract of science, really. It's something that, that there was a very good point made yesterday that if people aren't following the social contract of science, if they're not sharing their research and they're not sharing their data, it's basically scientific malpractice. And, and I think it was a really, really good point that publishers, just as much as researchers, can be guilty of this if they don't build systems which uh, enable the, the efficient exchange of information. So what we really need from publishers and from all the systems we're talking about building here and interoperating with is effective, efficient distribution models that can get researchers' information out to the widest possible audiences, which is what they want. Um, and this is also something we see now that research funders are just are demanding, governments are demanding, and it, it will become the main model. It's a question of how long it takes and who gets dragged kicking and screaming into it. Um, so 
what we're looking at in the Prime project um, is how to, once we've incentivized people to deposit data in places and, and to share the data, they've, they've often done this in a, in a very wide range of places. So this is a, for anyone who ever reads the XKCD cartoons, this is my adaptation of one of their maps. Um, there are lots and lots of different types of data repositories. We have general ones, we have subject ones, we have national ones, we have institutional ones. It, researchers can be putting their data in any of these places, um, often with different types of metadata. And what we're trying to do is find a way to make that more discoverable. So for example, on one of our data journals, we deal with all these different repositories. This is just for archaeology data. Um, and we want to know if someone puts their data into one of these repositories, probably people who are searching in the other ones want to know about it as well. How can we get all these repositories to talk to each other and share information about what their holdings are to make it much easier to find? Um, so one of the ways we first of all try to incentivize people to do this is, is through data journals. Um, my slides are a little bit of a surprise to me. I'm a little bit sleepy this morning. So the way a data journal works is you have data in a repository. Um, you can also have, it could be software as well. It, it's um, not a big difference. And ideally that repository, first of all, is a good one. It has a, a sustainable business plan. It has proper preservation plan. And it gives persistent identifiers like a DOI um, to the data. What, one of the reasons I talk a lot more about um, DOIs is because researchers already understand DOIs. It's what they use to cite data, uh, to cite regular research papers. So we think it's very, very important to use them for data as well because they understand the benefit and the, and the use of them for citation. Um, then the data journal comes along and basically have a, a series of data papers which also have a DOI um, and they link to each other through those DOIs. So there's a permanent link there that will, can, can't be broken, it will persist. And so the, the data paper simply describes the data um, and it, it's then referred to from research articles. So they're not the same thing. So if you write a, a, a research paper and you want to refer to the data you used, you would refer back to the, the data paper. And that, that sounds like a bit of a roundabout way, but they have very distinct um, uh, purposes. So the person who actually created the data set could be the, the lead author on the data paper, but they might only be the fifth or the sixth or not even an author on the research paper. So it's a way of giving people credit for having created data and having released it, made it open. Um, and the big benefit of that also is that because the, the data paper has a DOI, you can do all of the normal citation metrics and things. You can see how many people have cited it. You can start looking at impact metrics, which we were talking about for the ref before, which are very, very important. How many times has that data actually influenced uh, an article in Wikipedia? Who's tweeting it? Who's Facebook liking it, et cetera? What's happening in the wider community? So that, that's really the aim of the, the data journal. It's, it's there to incentivize the people who create the data to put it into a repository. And it's also a way to link up lots, all of those repositories into one place where you've got sort of a rich layer of metadata to make, that, make those things in all those siloed locations findable. Um, and very quickly, so the, the reason we use the data site DOIs is it's what, they're, what um, researchers are, are used to doing. But we, we use a um, cross-ref DOI for the data paper because it's the only way to track the citations. So you, you can't track the usage of a data site DOI yet, but you can track from a cross-ref DOI, so that's why the, the paper is very useful. Um, and data paper, very quickly, just to make it really clear, um, describes the methodology with which a data set was created. The data set itself describes the reuse potential. The, the reuse potential is very important. It's really what we're advertising with the paper, saying, come and find this data in this, this location and, and reuse it. These are the reasons. Um, so it's not a research paper and it's not a replication of information repository. It's really much richer information to help, it, help that data be found and reused. And the very important part about it is that it is, it's a fully peer-reviewed thing. And the, the big part about the, the peer review is that it's, it's about encouraging best practice. So the person, the data scientist, only gets to publish the data paper if they followed best practice. So they have to put the data into an acceptable repository uh, with you know, a sustainable um, model and a good preservation plan. They must give it an open license. They must make it actionable and open. All, all the things that were talked about yesterday to make it uh, intelligent was the word. And, um, and then they get the paper. So the peer review is really about enforcing best practice. The data could be rubbish. It could be awful. We still want people to publish it um, because that can then be used to invalidate their research papers, which are in 
uh, you know, could be talking about items in the public interest, for example. So that's the way that works. Um, and so we started off um, at Ubiquity Press doing a, a trial with a, a journal called the Journal of Open Archaeology Data, which works just like that. And that's the one we're using for the Prime project. So in order to test Prime out, where we're sticking within the confines of, of, um, of archaeology. But at the same time, this is now expanding out. We've got uh, psychology data. For example, there's been a lot of data fraud in the Netherlands recently. So we're launching a journal to help people validate the, the data behind uh, research publications in psychology. Also public health and doing the same thing for software as well. So we have an open research software journal to encourage people to make their software citable. Um, but for this, for the purpose of Prime, we're, we're focusing on the archaeology data journal. So now to, to jump into the Prime project, um, the, the aim is to develop a system to exchange metadata between, um, in this case, the UCL Discovery ePrints repository at, U at University College London, um, the Archaeology Data Service Subject Repository in York, and Journal of Open Archaeology Data. So we're taking a, a data journal, a subject-specific repository, and a institutional repository, and, and trying to get the metadata um, efficiently exchanged between those things. And the principle is once we've done that, that could then be rolled out to all other institutions, other journals, and other subject repositories. Um, so we're focusing on archaeology, building on some other GISC projects people might have heard of, um, Dryad UK, Reward, and um, Sword Arm. Um, the reward, reward project very quickly was a precursor to Prime, and basically it was um, it tested whether we could use data journals in order to get people to put their data into institutional repositories. And, and we found that that was very successful at UCL. So we're using that workflow again in Prime. Um, and we worked in things like preparing data management plans as well. Um, and that's the way that works. I'll jump over that. Um, so once again, the aim of Prime is to, is to find out where is the data. It's, it's to get researchers to discover data um, that they're interested in. So for example, if um, a researcher has put from UCL has put their data into the archaeology data service, um, UCL wants to know about that. They want to have a record of it um, because it's one of their researchers. So that's our first re um, use case. I'm just going to show you three quick use cases to, to finish things off. In this case, a UCL researcher would take their, their data, put it into the subject repository. Um, the metadata about that and a DOI would be sent to the institutional repository to, to um, create a record there. Um, and the aim being UCL wants to have a complete record of all its outputs. It's very important for the REF, which was mentioned earlier. Um, and that way they have a complete record, but the data is still held and curated in the, the place the researcher thinks is the best place, which is the subject repository where people have the right expertise. Um, that can go exactly the other way, so a researcher can put some archaeology data into the institutional repository, and the system knows that ADS is very interested in archaeology data, so it then receives a record about it as well. But once again, the data is held in, only held in the main place that's referred to by DOI further out. And the third use case involves uh, the journal. In this case, the, in the course of writing the data paper, all of the metadata will be collected, which is then sent on to the various subject repositories. And this is based on the way we, we did the, the Dryad UK project, which was about getting researchers to write who were submitting articles in evolutionary biology journals to, to um, also submit the data behind those articles to uh, the Dryad data repository. So we're doing the same thing, really. The researcher comes to the journal, writes their data paper, which is basically a, a high-level metadata record about the data. That then gets sent to the repository, and they get given a link which says, click on this link to deposit your data in the repository. They go through it, and everything's already filled out for them because the metadata's gone ahead. They simply upload the data set into the repository. And then because we also know that the institutional repository is interested in this, a record is then sent on to the institution as well. So the aim is that the researcher only has to enter the metadata once and that it's replicated to all the stakeholders that are interested in it. But the data itself is only held in the most optimal place for it to be curated and preserved. Right, so I'm out of breath. Um, and very quickly, my last slide is that the, the methodology we're employing for this, so that this project is just getting underway now. Um, whoop, yeah, go backwards. Uh, we're creating a metadata profile 
Um, and initially, this is going to be based simply on the data site metadata profile. We're not looking at need, any reason that we need to extend that at the moment, though at some point things like serif elements could, could possibly be, be very interesting. But this is really about the minimum amount of metadata that needs to be exchanged between repositories like who created the data set, who's the funder, what's the title of it, and what's the, what's the persistent identifier. Um, even, even just that small amount of information is enough to, to make a useful record in any of these repositories uh, along with the subject information. And then the metadata exchange, um, initially we're going to use symplectic elements, um, which was also mentioned in, in the last talk, which is a system which harvests um, data from around, uh, from various publishers and other, other places and makes them available to the university repository as a way of putting the information into UCL discovery. Um, and this way, if someone puts some data into the ADS, for example, the Archaeology Data Service, Symplectic will discover that they will send it through to UCL, and the researcher will be asked, is this your data? Um, you know, are you willing to claim it? If they just click the yes button, then it creates a record in the repository for them. Um, and so they harvest that. And later on, we're going to extend this to any ePrints repository, even if it doesn't um, use uh, Symplectic. And... Then we're going to collect case studies as well from all the researchers who take part and whose data um, is propagated through the system to try and understand how they're motivated to use the system and whether they, they feel that it's a useful thing and, and whether it has much impact on the discoverability of their data. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Please.